Okay. My name is Dave Westcott. We are here at the uh, Wood Smoke International Classic Camping and Bushcraft Symposium in Tetonia, Idaho. We're right here at the base of the Teton Mountains and on the Idaho-Wyoming border. And we've gotten together to um, have a symposium on these two, these two big subjects, woodcraft and classic camping and bushcraft and how they fit together. And we've brought together people who are interested in those topics, people who've been writing on the subject, people who've been teaching on the subject. And I'm here with Morris Kohansky, who's been one of my mentors and teachers and good friends for a number of years. I've stolen lots of information from him, but, but I always credit you. That's the one thing I've tried to do. So I always give back to the person who's uh, provided me the information that I've used in my classes. I own a company called Backtracks right now that sponsors this event and Rabbit Stick and Winter Count. And I used to own Boulder Outdoor Survival School. So what do you do? Well, I am being a freelance wilderness living skills instructor. I get around, I guess. And uh, because I have uh, authored a book called Bushcraft, and uh, the symposium was essentially on that subject, we, uh, I guess uh, I, I should make some effort to get here, sort of thing. And I knew the benefits. Uh, man, I've, uh, I, I always say I wish I was experiencing this 30 years ago yeah. because uh, stuff I'm picking up here should be uh, picked up by somebody who is quite young to be able to apply it the way it should be applied for the uh, for many years. Uh, uh, I enjoy all these events because uh, I get treated like a king and, and so on. And uh, I have the opportunity to do what I like to do, which I thrive off of talking to people, telling to <laughs> people have to listen to me because I'm up at the front of the room talking. Yeah. A, lot of subject, a lot of subjects where they're doing these get together like other rendezvous and stuff. They, they say that there's a graying of the of the age group going on, and I, I, I see just the opposite happening here. I mean, we're seeing all the way from very, very young kids and families, um, clear up to middle-aged and, and seniors. I mean, it's a broad-based broad, broad based group of people that are interested in these skills. Yeah, yeah bushcraft is uh, a kind of a sophistication, probably, we're not gonna probably go into its definition, uh, that people interact qu quite a bit more with, the, with what they see around them and uh, they want to get a handle on the, uh, the, the way things our grandparents and our, our, our parents, grandparents and our ancestors perhaps even in Europe did. And I find that it's a, a very enjoyable, exhilarating type of knowledge, better than most uh, type of activities. I often badmouth stamp collecting. But uh, the, the situation is that when you get together with like minds, you really, you know, one person chugs along, two people can do three or five times as much. You get a huge group of people, the interchange is phenomenal. And that's one of the big values to me because it really fills out a lot of the missing pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that, that uh, you know, you're trying to create. Uh, some of us are almost arrogant enough to say we're, we're completing your jigsaw puzzles, but, mm -hmm. but uh, the people that are coming up want to want to get the benefit of all of that. Yeah, the idea on this is to break down barriers, uh, to bring people together that have been doing it on their own, but at the same time we've shared information either through publications or through communication on t telephone or mail or on video, and so we are aware of one another, but we've we have, a lot of us haven't met one another, and to be able to meet one another and, and see each other face to face and actually learn from and teach one another that to me is where this, the true heritage of all of this stuff comes from, that it's a face-to-face, person-to-person process. And when you do that, then you see a person, you see their teaching style, you, see the, you learn more about the information that they, that they have to share, and then you can combine that and bounce off of how, how you teach and the way you do things, and it makes you a better, uh, well-rounded uh, person in the outdoors. Yeah, all the events that I've attended here, you know, I, as a Canadian, I. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, what, what I find is that I think the population density uh, in the United States should sustain people like myself, but it, it's very surprising how few people there are. And, uh, you know, and I feel so privileged to be uh, coming across the border and, and, and doing my, uh, and it's sort of uh, almost addictive in a way. I thoroughly enjoy these trips, but I come mainly for a reason that when I have been at home alone, enough time and I'm hankering to pick up a lot of pointers. I usually 
uh, can counter it because the people that we encounter at these events I call the titans. The, when you know something about who they are, they're at the top of their of the heap, mm -hmm. and and especially many of them are are the ones that are so willing to share and learn that by sharing a lot, you don't uh, jeopardize or compromise your stuff. You you actually get more work. You actually uh, get more knowledge by being, you know, helpful and open, uh, rather than being jealous about what you think you know and, and and participating in that type of dynamics. This is your what third or fourth trip down here with us. Fourth trip. Mm, uh, uh, a couple with rabbit stick. Uh, yeah. Well, with rabbit stick, I think I've come f possibly four times, four times is my memory. So your fifth time coming down here. And the, fir uh, the first, you know, this, uh, this is the first time here. I, and I, and I, I come down to Minnesota with uh, Don Bright, uh, Don Cavellas uh, a lot, so probably a dozen times uh, since I met him. And then I went up there, I'm trying to remember what year I went up there and first met you. It was probably 80, what, 80... 88 or 89 or 90, somewhere around there. And then we did a course with you, it was 50 below for the entire week we were there. Trees were <laughs> popping. Uh, it was a cold, cold week. Well, it's a, uh, the, the cat might be out of the bag, but uh, I tell people that you always happen to come right at the, the most ideal time for you to come and all that, so you might think. <laughs> I often feel that possibly in your eyes I'm 10 times as much as yeah, I am, but yeah. it's just fortunate that anytime you come, there's the opportunity to get an insight that uh, maybe I'm a lot better than I am. But uh, yeah, it's always fun when you, when you get that and, and you, you get a taste of what Canadians uh, are up to. In our, there's not many of us, but all right. We have a bit of fun there. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the reason I went up early on was that uh, when I owned the, the survival school, we would try to send our staff out. The only way they could get a bonus or a raise was to go out and learn from somebody else and then bring that information back because our goal was not to be so inbred that we only taught our opinion on something. The idea was to go out and learn from another instructor, see what they had to teach, bring back the best practices of what was going on in the field, and then, and then teach those to our students who in turn would essentially become our competitors by being the teachers of the skills that they learned from us. And so my goal was in going up to, to see, meet you in Canada was to do exactly that same thing. We were specializing in de de high desert survival skills and you were doing things in the boreal skills and we wanted to kind of expand our repertoire. So that's why I ended mm -hmm. up there. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I've been uh, confronted with this issue. People will say, when you take that person who's trains from you and then sets up their own school, aren't you cutting your own throat? And I said, well, uh, I, being Polish ancestry, uh, I sort of think it's the opposite, that the more healthy you are, the more you have connections and the more work you get. And I think that uh, reflecting on the past 40 some years, that's worked far better. I, you know, I come to this event and you know, every fourth person is somebody who I know very well from that dynamics mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, th and those people, uh, you know, they probably appreciate the boost, but that boost was, did more for me maybe than it did for them. Right. Yeah. The other thing is you don't, we don't own the skills. I mean, the skills came to us through indigenous people or people who've been practicing them for generations. And whether it's their obligation or it's just the way they do things, they've passed them on to us. And to me, it's our obligation to pass them on once again. I, I can't say that I can trademark anything. You know, this is stuff that I've, I've learned and, and uh, it needs to be passed along. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're at a time in our culture to where I think they're probably more in demand and, and more applicable. Some, th some people say what we teach is an anachronism, they're not appropriate for our time, but I think just the opposite, they're probably more applicable today than they've ever been. Well, I, I especially feel that there is no harm to really mix in a lot of this stuff because I'm very big on the hands-on don't talk so much but do a lot with your hands and that really applies mm -hmm. to the children, uh, the schools, uh, the school children from kindergarten to grade 12. In the last 17 years that's been a very big part of my, um, my, my livelihood and uh, people don't uh, realize, well I gotta tell a story. Long ago there was a comment on how come the best surgeons in eastern the United States, invariably, almost always were farm boys. You know, brought up on a farm, 
go to university to become a surgeon. And today we know that they got that boost from ha using their hands and what you do is being brought up as a, uh, on a farm and whatever. And that really stands out that the kids today get so little of that, something meaningful. That is, if, instead of cutting paper and making a doll, you're making it out of cattails. Instead of uh, talking about sandstone, the kids are experiencing it directly because a piece is brought in and they make something out of it. And to those, peop to those kids, in retrospect, I have, a, I have an instructor here that he met me when he was in grade six. And, uh, well, the curse was that he decided to go in this direction, but, well, he, he, he's done very well in life, but to him, uh, he's uh, happiest when he's mm -hmm. interrelating with nature, I even as an adult and that sort of thing. Yeah, when we had the survival school, what we tried to teach, well, what our instructors tried to impart to people was that we, we weren't in the business of training hermits. In other words, people who were going to go out and just check out a society and not be a contributing member anymore. But it's quite the opposite. The, the skills that we were teaching were, were to get people to be more in tune with, with where they fit into our culture and how they can contribute. And if you can, can, train, can use traditional or primitive skills to bolster confidence, uh, a better attitude, a, a better stewardship of the land and the people that you're training, then that, that will come back and benefit all of us rather than just one mm -hmm. person's little toolkit. Yeah, well, I'm finding that uh, the failure of our power lines which uh, very often are repaired within days. Sometimes they take a long, long time. And so your camping skills, you can't, I think your, your, uh, uh, the, 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 the city or, or the municipality or these people that govern, that set the rules, they are very uncomfortable with us isolating a room in our house and putting an airtight in there and keeping the family warm. warm. And it is a kind of a problem. Uh, that would be a dire, very dire emergency, but when you set up your tent in the corner and you convert to living that way and you know how to do it skillfully, uh, it perhaps is, uh, uh, you know, uh, much more benign, much, <laughs> you know, sort of a, a, an approach. So the civil authorities maybe are, are acknowledging that might, might be a cheaper way to go than providing you with an Atco trailer that you're still self-sufficient, you're still staying home, taking care of things, but you're not going to burn the house down, thereby burn the block down. And it's, a, it's a very liberating skill set to have in reserve, so if you need to apply it when you need it, you can. You know, a lot of this stuff aren't skills that people are going to use every single day, but on the other hand, unless, unless you practice them, unless you get to where things are automatic, um, and you, you know how the tech, technique works on a certain piece of material, uh, then when you go to apply it, it's not going to work. And so this idea of, of not only having things in reserve, but also taking the time to practice skills on a regular basis, how to use a knife, how to use an axe, what, whatever, to where things become automatic and smooth and you do them efficiently. It's like they were saying that the a true woodsman style is, is even if he trips over a log, it looks like he meant to do it. Or, or even if his pants are on fire, you know, you do everything in a very specific way and with a very specific style. And so you can do that not even having to go to wilderness, you can do that in your backyard and practice it every single day. So. Well, I, I realized very quickly, uh, the only way that I could become a millionaire is if I wrote enough books, maybe, because instructing and teaching people, you know, it, it's uh, uh, instructor is never going to become a millionaire. So I thought that I would want to live like a millionaire. Well, millionaires probably have a horrible existence, but I, I like the notion that I could wake up almost any time of the day, go to bed any time of the day, and work mostly two days of the week instead of five days of the week, never having to do the same thing twice in a row. <laughs> uh, growing, you know, growing a garden, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the laws of the universe say that that the time you spend growing a garden and working in a garden and fishing are not subtracted from your, your longevity and all that. And, and a lot of people say, why are you wasting your time growing those potatoes? You can buy them in the, yeah. in the store. And I look at them and I say, well, I can't explain it, but you do it your way and I'll do it my way. Yeah. And I'll probably be that much more healthy and that much more whatever. And so all the things that I did were often within my financial limits. And today, I'm an environmentalist because I was doing all these green things because they were, you know, the cheapest thing, uh, you know, whatever, I ramble. But. So the skills you're using now, the skills you're teaching now to people, I mean, they're things that came right out of your history, right out of your culture. Oh, yes. Uh, no small reason that I 
uh, you know, compared to other people. Being brought up on an isolated farm where they, you know, uh, my parents uh, had a tradition from Poland of being forest people, you know, the mushrooms, the berries, and the fishing, and, uh, uh, you know, the, they, they often chose poor farmland because they, they were concerned that if things got tough, they could depend on the forest and providing. And of course, you live that from day one, and, and then uh, that caused me to to uh, decide that I really liked the the wilderness and became a surveyor, where I was paid rather handsomely to go off into the far corners of the w wildness and and so on. And so, there's probably a bit of a selfish reason that I always felt that I enjoyed that way more than anything else, and and that drove me. But I also had, uh, had decided that I wanted to become a writer, that it would have been the coolest thing in the, in the world to be able to be recognized as the person who wrote. And fortunately, I pulled it off a bit, so. Well, I think the level of your skill is, is unique to that background where mine probably came about, where, where, which is more typical to a person who's in our culture today. I mean, I, I considered myself a country kid, but I wasn't, I wasn't dependent upon those techniques in order to, to stay alive. I had parents that you know, had jobs and provided an, in, an income, but I also had a dog and a knife and spent most of my time outdoors, and, and the thing that fascinated me probably was, was the skills that, that took to, to live out there, and then when I got into scouting, of course, that, that took off, but then, you know, my interests went way beyond what, what the scouting movement provided mm. at the time, so, uh, which I think is more, more typical of the average person. They're, they have an affinity for the outdoors, they have a real interest in, and fascination for the skills, and to find teachers who can really teach competently is becoming rarer and rarer. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, most of this sort of uh, uh, something that gives us a lot of satisfaction is to drive stuff from, from nature. When my parents came to, the, uh, to, to Saskatchewan, uh, their effects were brought in thing, trunks that were woven like very complex baskets. Later on, uh, as I reflected on things and asked my mother, I said, those trunks, well, what's the story there? Oh, your father wove them because we needed the trunks. Mm. And I remember them. They were, they were as good as any weaving. You could. My father was illiterate, and yet he could weave those baskets. Uh, um, the, there were many things. like I, uh, <clears throat> I remember a, um, a covering for the bed, and I learned that my mother wove that, and it was a work of art <laughs> when we took her to the museum. Uh, in uh, in Edmonton, and there happened to be a, a special exhibit on looms. So she immediately explained all the things about it, and uh, and we said, well, we'll buy a loom. You know, you, you actually, it's uh, uh, the people who weave can make big money. And she said, no way would I ever touch a loom a loom again because and he, she had to do it, and uh, she was assigned to do that tedious, long-term uh, uh, clothing that I, I wore were hand-me-downs from my. Older brothers, uh, she wove herself out of linen. They had to do make the linen, and you couldn't buy string. You'd have to grow it, and uh, couldn't buy rope. You grew, grew it on and on. And that also was something that I could see. My father often incorporated these things where they're they were suitable, and I didn't say, "Oh, my father is really skilled in bushcraft." And and maybe a quarter of the book are the ideas that I re sort of remember. My father did it that way. Mm -hmm. And it seems a very organic way and it's appropriate, but by then my father was long gone. I came home once and I had just uh, begun to get good at the flint and steel. And he watched me for a while because I said, hey, Dad, you know, you probably did it. That he watched me and then he says, well, sort of, well I, I, I'll show you. <laughs> and the next few hours, he, he, I hurtled ahead in the, in the knowledge behind what you do uh, because there was no matches when, when he was growing up. So he did a demonstration for you. Oh yeah, he took me and we walked through the bush and he showed me the fungi and, and how to process it and uh, you know all the things that went with that. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I, I just would never had an inkling that he was that knowledgeable on that until I attempted to show him what I knew. <laughs> another, another thing that I picked up from you a lot was this whole concept of, of crafting. In other words, you know, knife axe saw is nice for the sake of splitting wood and, and, and building your fire and cooking your meal. But the other is actually the production of things that either things that could be used in your daily life or things that you could use for sale or things that you, that you just create for beauty in your own life. And the, the, I, I don't think enough people realize that that is what you've done a lot of, yeah. uh, just from a survival standpoint, literally, um, rather than just the, the heavy-ended 
skills. Yeah, well, uh, there's a lot of leisure opportunity when, you know, you get tired of every, you, you work pretty hard, with students and the instructor up till supper time, and then after supper, uh, you want to let up. Well, you could see if you showed somebody some of these folk crafts and all that, how much they enjoyed, uh, how they took to it. And I thought, well, kill two birds with one stone. Well, three birds, actually, because they would learn about traditional folk toys. Mm -hmm. They would develop their knife skills, and they would be doing something quite enjoyable that would motivate them to continue. Because when you go into artificial skill development, it doesn't, uh, you know, it sort of wanes on you after a while. It's out of context. Yeah. 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 I mean, if it doesn't have an application, why do it? Yeah, so that sort of came up early. Well, the first insight I had is that I saw this article on... Um, how to make a doll out of handfuls of grass, which led to the cattail doll. And I, we went to get grass to twist cord and for kindling. And just as a thing, I said, this is the way the native people, I whipped one together. I couldn't, now for the next hour, <laughs> I had to stop because everybody was making one. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that, that got to add that to my repertoire because I didn't realize that latent desire in people right. to want to do you know to to do that yeah, is we were at, we did a re-encampment on the we were on the quad at Appalachian State University a couple of years ago Steve Watts and, and Wayne Williams and a few of us were there we set up our tents on the quad and had canvas tents and of course the students were all used to nylon tents since they were coming around and they were saying well are, are you going to stay here and we said well, yeah, we're going to camp right here on the quad and they said well what if it rains and well we have beautiful <laughs> canvas tents they'll do just fine well while we were sitting there doing it, I started carving these gypsy flowers. And I was just kind of doing it as a demonstration on how to carve, a, how to handle a knife and how to carve a, a gypsy flower. And I'd carve these little flowers out and put them on a piece of uh, baling wire that I had and stick them in a jar. Well, people started wanting, coming around wanting to buy them. And then I would just give them away. And then probably 15 minutes later, out came these secretaries from the buildings all wanting gypsy flowers now because <laughs> girls would come walking in and say, oh, look what the guys are making. So I ended up making like 90 gypsy flowers to warm myself out. But my knife skills were really good that day, uh -huh. uh, and people were just fascinated with, the, with being able to create beauty out of a stick. Yeah, the, the trade shows, I often would get invited to folk uh, festivals and a lot of those sort of things. And what ended up happening there is that you're doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. over, uh, that doesn't happen too often, maybe four times a year, but you discover that by doing that over and over again that the refinement of your skills can be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. When you light fire with, with you know, every different way in 20 minutes mm -hmm. and then you repeat that five times a day, each time gets better and you leave the trade show like un invincible. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the secret of invincibility right. is that you, you do that, and uh, uh, the one time, one one time, I was uh, I, I'm known as the doll man. I probably I always claimed that if it wasn't for the cattail doll, I might not have survived because that it opened up the doors to crafting. Because uh, a kindergarten child loves a cattail doll, so does an 80 year old grandmother. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I go to this girl guide uh, um, uh, event that's about four or five thousand girl guides. And I brought a bundle of cattail mostly for demonstration because the way it was set up. It, and then I realized they all had different color hats and they were trading pins that go on the hat. And I thought, I'll make little dolls they could pin to their mm -hmm. hats. Man, that was the currency. I, I probably, people, people would give me almost anything, but you know, I, 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 I just gave them away. But if I went to the cafeteria to eat and the woman says, are you the man that makes those dolls? And she says, as long as you bring me a doll, your meals are free. And I would, she would, there was also, I'd make That's her, you know, enough thing. dolls that, that it would compensate her. I wasn't just going to, you know, take advantage of her. But, you know, and the amount of uh, uh, the, the doll was just such a door opener. And, and it was something that I fell back on when I, uh, when I realized that I was going to be working in this school district for 60 days. And that I was going to be dealing with kids from kindergarten to grade six primarily. And I had no idea what I would do with them, but I knew I could work dolls. So that year, I, I think it was maybe four Datsun loads. Oh. That was all you could load on a Datsun uh, and, and be still lash it down and get it to its destination. And there I became a doll maker yeah. at uh, Doll Maker University. One of, the, one of the, I don't know if it's a complaint or if it's a question or if it's a concern that people voice all the time about this idea of using natural resources to create things. In other words, using felling a tree or using down whatever it is that we're using from the land in order to create to create things. 
and the quote unquote impacts that it creates. What, what do you, how do you respond to that kind of stuff? Well, uh, first of all, I would say that it's a trait of human nature to be concerned. Modern people want to be, they're, they're aware that abuses occur and all that. And basically my way of handling that is to dissipate it by, you know, explaining what is done. You know, when I first started in this, you, you, uh, when you build a survival camp, you know, everything is like learning how to swim. You don't learn how to swim by watching or reading a book or watching a video. You've got to get in the water. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but there has to be somebody that has to consolidate the knowledge. Well, how, if you're going to build a lean-to, uh, you, uh, you've got to cut down trees. And if everybody's going to build a lean-to, more trees are cut down. But the individual that needs, needs that knowledge, in my way of thinking, and I can argue it, if they don't build it themselves, they probably will die from the fact that they don't know enough because you got to build it to see what it takes so you have an idea and then you got to live in it to see how it leaks and what it does and then you got to learn to correct it and on and on that can't be done any other way no. and I was just as concerned as the people but I wasn't as sensitized as some people are and it, it, you, you, you'd fall a tree, start falling a tree, you're going to fall explaining a fall a tree and some students, this happened a number of times, would say are you going to chop down that tree, that beautiful tree? And I would say, yeah. Well, if you're chopping it down for my benefit, I, I don't feel comfortable that you do it. Well, then I, oh, well, 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 you know, like, I don't know. Well, mm -hmm. the next time that happens, I had a lot more rationale. And then eventually, uh, I would tell people before we even started, you know, you, you've got this dynamics. You've got to understand that from your perspective, I know that without you chopping down the tree, we're wasting our time in a way. And I got better and better at it. But I said, I'm going to be very careful. Number one, for every tree, tree I chop down, I, 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 I'm in the mood I'll plant a tree mm -hmm. to begin with as a starter. And that I will only take the sick tree. I will take the dead tree, the sick tree, the crooked tree, the tree that loggers don't use. And when I'm left, they say, let's make this into a park because all the it's so groomed and nothing. Then you come back 10 years later and it's just as bad as, you know, because everything's fallen That's down. Right. And, and what, what really transpired is that as time went on, I began to realize exactly what the consequences of my actions were. And they were t entirely different from what people's imaginations, because they figure you fell a tree, you got a vacuum. And, and you know, that, that's a, we could want to talk on here for hours about this. But the situation was that explain to people what it is, explain to people that you have three choices. You can leave it better than you found it. You can leave it alone or you can leave it worse than you found it. No one should leave it worse because that's repugnant. That serves no role in our future existence. Mm -hmm. If we leave it as we found it, what does that serve? That only serves to the people with the virginity complex. They want to have the privilege to see the forest before it was altered by anybody. That's asking a little much <laughs> as a human right. because, you know, for that. And it's really so remarkably easy to leave it better than you found it. And then I'll say to people, you know, you use electricity. Well, then how many two by fours does it take to build a house? So what are you giving me as of falling the street? Mm -hmm. And I say, when they clear the power lines and they keep it, uh, uh, you know, free of the trees that could fall on the lights, I said, I don't see it as a bad thing because there's flowers and plants that have been waiting for that opening for generations. And now they got the opening and in diversity, there's stability on and on. So their lack of understanding in uh, environmental issues is what makes them so concerned and they stand and they, they're often their own worst enemies and they imply you know, well, anyway. yeah, I'm talking to the, I, know, yeah, I, know. I know you know all that yeah. sort of stuff but yeah, this whole idea goes back to the idea that, that you need to interact with the environment I mean that yeah. this idea of walking through and looking at it not knowing the, the names of the plants or, or the cycles of the plants <clears throat> or anything else in this look don't touch thing I think it has a place and there are places there where, where they should be demonstration areas and we should have as much preservation as possible but, yeah. but there are also areas where we should be interacting with that with the plants and interacting with the resources available and yeah. i think it's i think it's to the betterment of both ourselves and the environment that yes. we live in. well just think when you meet a beautiful girl how you're motivated to want to meet that beautiful girl because she appeals to you mm. so you hold back you look you watch and so on but there's a time when it's got to go further it's got to hold hands. You got to, you got to uh, come into close contact, and uh, and and as that happens, uh, there develop there develops either uh, uh, an, a consolidation. The two of you become a fairly powerful, strong entity if it's done right. 
and it just falls by the wayside if it's not done, done right. And the issue with the relationship with the forest is one that the people who, who interact in it, you know, it's the big industry that caused the problem, and then we think us as individuals caused the problem. To finish sort of our talk here, I bought 17 acres of land, and I, it was all uh, cultivated farmland grass, grass for mowing. Now, for every tree I cut down in my career, there's a tree growing on my property, thick as hair on your head. Mm. Because, uh, and I have participated in tree planting things because I said, but, uh, I cut the trees, uh, I show my, my, you know, the tree, I owe that to the tree to make sure that, that I have uh, made an attempt to, to propagate the trees. Well, I think the shared philosophy between us, I think is important. And the whole idea of being able to spend time with other people and to get the, the idea of, of uh, the importance of interacting with the land, of learning skills from the land. I mean, you can go back to the idea of Aldo Leopold's quote, that, that woodcraft is a working knowledge of the land. And I think that working knowledge is something that uh, is to the benefit not only to the land, but to yourself as well. And to improve the resources that we use to improve ourselves in the process, I think that's what we both share in common, regardless of, uh, of where we are. I mean, what we do down here is a little different than what's being done in the boreal north, but we've been always been able to, to uh, borrow resources from you and uh, <laughs> borrow resources from you, both in the, in the form of knowledge and material and make our programs better, and hopefully we've been able to sh share some of the things back with you. Yeah, the, the movie goers would be quite impressed and, and, <laughs> and you, they might not notice you toss, toss your phone away, but that's, that's a good way. That's my life. <laughs> so I suppose that we, we have said enough to turn everybody's heads by now and, and the phone is, uh, was uh, karma signaling it's time to quit. Yeah. <laughs>